text data mining researchers often want to analyze texts and other primary materials that are available online in one sense, but not necessarily available to them, or at least not for the purpose of text data mining. We might be talking about journal articles hosted by commercial publishers, or social media content hosted by Facebook, classified ads hosted by Craigslist, or even company press releases on a corporate website. Here we face distinct questions of can you and should you. The salient point being that just because you can get to this content doesn't mean that you should. This content may be hidden behind a paywall, not shared at all, or access may be subject to terms and conditions that don't permit text data mining. The basic contract law issues in this scenario have been or will be dealt with elsewhere, but in addition to those issues, researchers also need some familiarity with anti-hacking laws such as the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, or CFAA. These laws make it illegal to access someone else's computer system without authorization. I'm sure that we can all imagine some scenarios where access is clearly authorized or clearly unauthorized, but there is a substantial gray area in between that we need to address. Let's begin by talking about access to websites protected by a password, a paywall, or similar devices. And let's think about how this would be governed under the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. The CFAA is a pre-internet law aimed at preventing computer hacking. It was apparently inspired by the film War Games. The CFAA has been around for a while, but there is still some ambiguity about the scope of conduct it prohibits. As the Supreme Court has explained, the statute provides two ways of committing the crime of improperly accessing a protected computer. One, obtaining access without authorization, and two, obtaining access with authorization, but then using that access improperly. Let's start with something simple. Accessing a password-protected computer system without authorization, or when authorization has been specifically revoked, violates the CFAA. Working around authentication controls or permission requirements, such as usernames and passwords, using stolen usernames and passwords, or somehow defeating payment requirements, are all examples of conduct that would violate the CFAA in most circumstances. This kind of conduct should be strictly avoided. So much for the easy cases of breaking and entering. What about just being a bad guest? Most courts recognize that there is a critical distinction between violating terms and conditions of access and accessing a computer system without authorization. Whether merely violating terms of access to a computer system that is not open to the public triggers Computer Fraud and Abuse Act liability is still a matter of contention. The better view, adopted by the Ninth Circuit and the Fourth Circuit, is that it doesn't. However, the First, Seventh and Eleventh Circuits take a broader view of what it means to, quote, exceed authorized access under the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. The difference largely comes down to whether the court sees the CFAA as an anti-intrusion statute or embraces a more contract-based interpretation of the CFAA's without authorization provisions. The emerging consensus appears to favor interpreting the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act as an anti-intrusion statute. This interpretation is particularly favored in cases where the computer system is available to the public at large without registration or password protection. In the recent case of HiQ Labs versus LinkedIn, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals held that accessing a computer system that is available to the public at large doesn't trigger liability under the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, even if permission to access has been specifically revoked. The Ninth Circuit reasoned that the CFAA is best understood as an anti-intrusion statute and not as a misappropriation statute and thus obtaining information by scraping that was available to anyone with a web browser fell outside the scope 
of the CFAA. In early 2020, the District Court for the District of Columbia addressed potential liability under the CFAA in a research context. The court in Sandvig v. Barr held that accessing online hiring websites for the purpose of conducting academic research would not necessarily violate the access provisions of the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, even though such access would clearly violate the website's terms of service. The researchers in this case were conducting audit testing on employment websites by submitting fake resumes in order to determine whether the algorithms used by the websites were racially biased. This deception clearly violated the applicable terms of service. Nonetheless, the court concluded that the CFAA does not criminalize mere terms of service violation on consumer websites, and thus the plaintiff's proposed research plans are not criminal under the CFAA. At the time of recording, the US Supreme Court had agreed to hear a case addressing these issues, but the hearing date has not yet been set. So allow me to sum up our recommendations on this topic. To avoid civil and criminal liability under the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, researchers should not defeat access controls to non-public computer systems. Researchers in the 1st, 7th and 11th circuits, i.e. the states of Maine, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, Puerto Rico, Rhode Island, Illinois, Indiana, Wisconsin, Alabama, Florida and Georgia, should also refrain from violating terms of service that govern access to non-public computer systems to avoid liability under the Act. Researchers in those jurisdictions planning to violate terms of service for access to computer systems open to the public are in a slightly better position, but they still face considerable risk. Outside the 1st, 7th and 11th circuits, we believe that the view that the CFAA is an anti-intrusion statute should hold sway, and thus a mere violation of terms of service should not trigger liability under the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. Of course, the Supreme Court may hold otherwise, and we will be watching the case of Van Buren versus United States with great interest.